And this, then you click on that link, that is the key to you uh, submitting your information for the uh, Pennsylvania Pesticide Applicators License. Also, if you're an ISA certified arborist, and if you're a Society of American Foresters certified forester, we have credits pre-approved for you. Certified foresters are category two, uh, and uh, they'll be approved for one hour of each of these. So for your Pennsylvania pesticide credit uh, license, you are uh, accredited for one hour. That's two credits, one of core and one of category. Our fellows coming today, and I guess the other thing I wanted to be sure that you knew is that we uh, put your put your questions in the question and answer pod, the Q&A pod. Uh, the chat pod is not working for me today. So we can only see your questions in the Q&A pod and that's where we can answer them. We'll have an hour of solid programming and then we'll have a, uh, a bit of a question and answer and we'll work through the quiz today. So I wanted to give you all that. And so be sure to catch that quiz link just in case we don't get it sent to you. So here's the quiz link, https extension.psu.edu slash IBM dash quiz. A moment of silence here. Today's talk is IVM or integrated vegetation management, non-target injury. So application prevention and response. Our presenters today are uh, D. Holbrook Dewar, who's a staff attorney for Penn State Ag Law Center. He's got a long experience with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and he's been with us at uh, Penn State uh, Ag Law Center now in Pittsburgh, or I'm sorry, not Pittsburgh, I believe it's uh, either on campus or Harrisburg, but he can straighten me out here uh, when he gets on. Also, we'll have Tom Ford, whom you may know has been with us for 37 years as an extension um, uh, uh, industry uh, horticulture uh, uh, educator. And uh, been, uh, so many of you are familiar with Tom speaking and uh, gave an excellent talk in June on for you online. So you wanted to catch that one too, if you get a chance. At this point, I uh, wanted to uh, re get our, uh, get to our hosts so that I don't take any more time up. Uh, Brooke, are, are you ready to go? Okay, I am. Yeah, yes, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Oh, excellent. And there's Tom with us. This is the first I got to see you, fellows. Good to see you both. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brooke. All right, let's get uh, the sharing underway here. I think this should work. All right, we should be seeing the screen. Let me just make maximize it here. There we go. Okay, so um, I want to thank uh, both uh, Scott and Tom for inviting me on here. I sort of invited myself, but I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, so this is going to be a little unusual because I'm an attorney, and what am I doing talking to a bunch of a bunch of pesticide applicators? Well, the connection here is that um, at the Penn State Ag Law Center, which is part of the law school. Uh, and we provide uh, ag legal education uh, and some states their extension would have a legal arm to it. Here it just happens to be attached to the law school and that's just a quirk of there's actually a Pennsylvania law that talks about this that authorizes this ag law center to be there. In any event uh, we have a small grant from the Pennsylvania Wine Marketing and uh, Research Board, which you see their logo here, which is utilizing money from the PA Liquor Control Board of all people. And uh, the reason why this is uh, uh, of interest and why this grant exists is because it was to do education with regard to legal liability for non-target injury. I like that better than overspray or drift or something. So I'll try to use non-target injury as much as I can. Uh, and of course, it's because of the wine industry and maybe its applicators you're well aware, uh, they are hypersensitive uh, and their grapes are seemingly hypersensitive, particularly to dicamba. So uh, there was a concern there and uh, they uh, funded some education uh, 
and so that's why I'm here, and that's why uh, we're, we're, you're hearing from a lawyer this morning. Now, what I'm going to do is a little bit different uh, because I'm going to talk about some legal subjects with regard to non-target injuries, and that's what we'll do first. To, and I'll give you sort of an overview of nationally where we sit, particularly with the dicamba things that are going on. There's litigation and uh, and that's a potential settlement, et cetera. And then I'll join you again later when we start talking about risk mitigation uh, for applicators and responding to complaints about crop damage. Uh, so uh, we will be uh, proceeding sort of my piece will be in two chunks. I'll try to talk as fast as I can. I'm a little notorious for going long, so we'll try to keep it quick. Okay, so non-target herbicide injury in the U.S. court system. Obviously, dicamba is the current focus. I'm going to leave all the science to others. That's not my area, but I can talk about some of the legal uh, things that are going on in the legal landscape. Now, the first important question that we're all sitting with right now legally is, will dicamba have a registration approved for 2021? As we sit right here today, dicamba has no legal uh, or has no EPA approved registration <clears throat> for use in the United States. So uh, at this point, it, it's they're feverishly attempting to get EPA to approve their registration so that the products can go back on the market in 2021. And of course, it's it's impacting not just the uh, herbicide but also the seed and the the uh, uh, that's made to go with the herbicide. So that's that's obviously number one legal question. I'm not going to talk about that one, however. Um, I'm going to assume that we will see dicamba back on the market with some type of product registration uh, for 2021. And uh, we're going to talk about, because uh, if we don't have a product registration, then uh, you know the, the issues regarding non-target uh, property damage and injury become so much less significant, let's say. We go back to the pre-2000 and 15 world, I guess it is, or is it 16? In any event, uh, we're going to talk about property damage lawsuits. And there's basically two types of property damage claims or lawsuits uh, that it can exist. And it's important to make this distinction to sort of uh, follow through on understanding what's going on legally out there. There are products liability claims against the manufacturers. Uh, particularly, of course, right now we're talking about dicamba. There are products liability claims against Monsanto slash Bayer, uh, as well as BASF and, and, and uh, Cortiva. Um, uh, or do I have in any event, um, I might be missing a manufacturer or misquoting, uh, but in any event, um, the products liability claims are claims against the manufacturer uh, based upon the product and the damage that the product has done or something that the manufacturer has done in marketing the product. And that's what er everything that has been going on in the news is really about, which is products liability claims against manufacturers. That's not you. That's, you know, you as an applicator have a whole, a whole nother uh, area that of concern, which is number two on this slide, which is applicator legal liability for, and there's various legal theories here, trespass, nuisance, negligence, or strict liability. I'll talk about all four of those and explain those to you. But first, it, to understand some of the legal landscape, it's important to understand these products liability claims uh, against the makers of the various dicamba products. Um, the first big question right now, and people, I'm going to assume people are somewhat familiar, and I'll talk about it some more uh, in a second, with the bait, actually I misspelled it, it's the Bader Farms, I misspelled it as Baden here, the Bader Farms verdict that came out of Missouri, uh, and it was a federal court in Missouri that awarded hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to Bader Farms, a peach orchard, a peach producer in Missouri, uh, for damage done by dicamba to their orchard and their entire operation. Um, so that's the only verdict that we really have uh, at this point against the manufacturer based upon uh, a product's liability theory that dicamba uh, was somehow um, uh, unreasonably dangerous is actually the word for it, which is, is probably uh, confusing to use in this context. But the, the bottom line is, uh, we don't know where that verdict is going to end up. It's just on appeal now. Now, um, there's a second issue riding out of that, or arising out of that, which is that Bayer has uh, proposed a settlement which seems to be moving forward, which will be a settlement 
potentially of all of their liability arising from the dicamba mess. Uh, so those are the two legal issues on the products liability front uh, in the big, you know, matters uh, that uh, involve Bayer uh, and uh, dicamba litigation. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about these products liability claims, and then we'll wrap that up and talk about your more important concern, which is applicator liability claims. Now, the U.S. federal courts have consolidated all products liability cases revol uh, involving dicamba um, in one federal court in a class action suit that is pending in Missouri. So no matter where you filed it, and there's like eight or nine different states where cases were sent to this Missouri federal court, they're handling them all in this one court in Missouri. And the, uh, uh, the, the formal name of the case is Dicamba Herbicides Litigation. Crop Damage Master Complaint is the thing that sort of controls the entire uh, uh, legal proceeding. And um, so that is pending in Missouri. Now, Parts of it have been dismissed, but the lawsuit's still sitting there. Now, the one case that was allowed to proceed separate from this particular consolidation of all of these cases into one court uh, in Missouri is the Bader Farms case. And the Bader Farms case uh, was early one, and it was done as sort of a test case. And it went to verdict in February of 2020, and again returned this $265 million verdict. 15 million of that was uh, for the actual compensation for economic losses to the orchard. 250 million of that was actually punitive damages against Bayer and BASF. Um, but in any event, there's the whopping huge verdict that has you know, made the news and it is now remains under appeal. It's, uh, that is just going to run its course. Now, there is a potential settlement of all of Bayer's liability relate, uh, arising from the marketing of dicamba. It's allegedly in, about, in the amount of about $400 million, which you see is, is not going to put a whole lot of a dent in, uh, or I'll put it this way, the Bader Farms case, if it, it is sustained at $265 million, eats up all of that. The uh, good part to understand is that the Bader Farms uh, verdict is completely uh, separate from this particular proposed settlement. It'll be dealt with whatever liability might exist to Bader is going to be dealt with separately. Um, but in any event, this settlement was announced by Bayer on June 24th of 2020. And since that time, there's really been no activity in terms of any kind of public confirmation of the details, the terms of it. Um, and there is a sort of a question as to whether this settlement may now be in doubt. It was announced at the same time that their Roundup liabilities, their glyphosate liabilities were uh, also may, uh, uh, settled, or at least the announcement was made that there was a settlement in principle, let's say. Uh, now, there's been some snafus in that particular settlement, which have uh, <clears throat> caused a little bit, a little bit uh, going off the rails, shall we say. Um, that uh, there hasn't been anything publicly announced that the settlement regarding dicamba has gone off the rails, but um, uh, we, that's just a news item to follow. So that's background as to these product liability um, cases. Now, what's the significance of all of this uh, to you as an applicator? Well, again, this is not a case involving an applicator, but the jury in this particular case readily accepted the idea that the dicamba caused the alleged non-target injury or what the jury has now found to be the non-target injury. And this proof of causation, you know, was highly disputed uh, in the case. And um, the extent of damages was also highly disputed. And in this particular case, they're kind of wrapped around each other um, uh, because uh, of the, the, the analysis of the damage that these, this peach orchard uh, had suffered uh, is, you know, very much in dispute in terms of whether dicamba caused it and how much damage is really done. Uh, can the orchard still thrive? Part of the, the thing that's going on right now is there are all sorts of evidence, excuse me, of uh, uh, the damage, excuse me again, not being as bad as they claimed at the trial. But in any event, um, the fact that a jury accepted this causation, that di dicamba caused the damages that they were claiming to this very large peach operation, that sort of is a precedent that doesn't 
bind any jury, but it does start to sort of bend public sentiment and the and sort of uh, direct the course of all all of this you know legal uh, uh, mechanizations that are going on towards uh, the idea that juries are as a general rule perhaps going to accept the, that dicamba is causing the damages that people are complaining about. And that is important in and of itself because it kind of sets, they, set, they separated this case as a test case and um, it, it, they tested the, the idea, would a jury be able to comprehend and uh, conclude that dicamba is causing um, the things that people are seeing in the field? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, so I think that did provide feedback to the industry and um, uh, those who, you know, who are trying to defend against claims uh, of this nature, property damage claims from dicamba, non-target injury, um, uh, were certainly disheartened, let's say, by the outcome. Because once you sort of have the, 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 the flow going a certain way, when you have ho literally hundreds and hundreds of cases, um, uh, that sort of dictates what's going to happen with settlement. And I don't think it's any surprise that the reason why there was this large settlement proposal to try to take care of all of these cases through a, a, basically a $400 million class action settlement was that uh, that verdict, you know, went so badly for Monsanto. Okay, now, and again, this is just sort of a slide that illustrates the idea of, um, you know, is the picture on the left going to be accepted by the jury as having been caused by di caused by dicamba? Uh, and you just have sort of the, the these are the this is the kind of evidence and things that juries will have to decide in these types of claims. Um, and this was in fact dicamba damage from a, a, a vineyard in the state of Indiana. Uh, and, and of course, the economic damage from the failed fruit development and the you know uh, a significant yield reduction, you know. Is, is sizable, no question about it. Um, now, let's talk about applicator legal liability. The reason I talked about all that other stuff up to now was to give you a flavor for the fact that uh, these things can be significant, these claims can be significant, and um, they, some of the defenses to the claims are not panning out so well right now. In other words, denying that dicamba caused the damage and also denying that the damage is as serious as the uh, as the landowner who's impacted is claiming have not gone well on either of those two issues uh, for the party that's being claimed to have caused the damage. A uh, long way for a lawyer to say basically the you know writing on the wall is not looking so good. Um, Okay, applicator legal liability comes in four forms. And these are, some of these are old legal terms. Some of them are uh, a slightly uh, disfavored or dis, not, not used as frequently as others. There's a thing called trespass, which is the molecules, and I'm just gonna bring it down to its basic evidence, essence. The molecules of your herbicide have crossed the, the, the uh, property line between uh, another property and the complainants, we'll just call them, or the plaintiff, uh, the plaintiff's property, and they've caused some damage. So that is technically under the law, trespass. Um, uh, now, uh, there's also a thing called nuisance, which is liability for interfering with somebody's use and enjoyment of their land, which again, the, these types of uh, non-target injury claim uh, can be couched as a nuisance claim. So it could be couched as a trespass claim, a nuisance claim, or both, because they're generally lawyers put them together cumulatively. The big one, however, that is the big issue is a negligence claim. And negligence is basically liability for damage caused by failing to employ reasonable care to prevent damage from one's actions. So when you're driving down the road and you blow the stop sign and you hit another car, that is because you, and you're found liable for causing an injury, that is because you failed to employ reasonable care to prevent your car from injuring somebody else while you were driving it. There's your negligence claim. Okay. Um, you know, that trespass doesn't work unless you drove your car onto somebody else's pro property. Uh, and again, nuisance would kind of be the same thing. Um, uh, now, um, in other words, you, it would have to happen. It's, those are related to your property. Uh, negligence 
doesn't have to happen on your property necessarily, although of course that's what we're dealing with here uh, in a non-target injury. And then there's strict liability. That's a, that's a sort of old theory, a slightly antiquated theory that says anytime you're using some type of what's in the law called ultra hazardous substances, you can be strictly liable regardless of how careful you were with it if you cause damage. The classic version of this was blasting and um, uh, that uh, that's always considered to be an ultra hazardous uh, 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 activity and if you cause uh, damage to people's homes, let's say by, you know, blasting and, you know, for a, a road construction or something like that, that's actually a strict liability. You don't have to prove that the contractor was negligent in the way in which they were conducting the blasting. That, that's a very rare occurrence. Nobody has quite put a non-target injury into that particular legal theory and made it work in Pennsylvania yet, but in any event. Those are the four theories, but let's talk about negligence because that's really the one that matters. That's the one that this is going to be all about. Trespass, nuisance, strict, li strict liability all have various legal hurdles that hinder their success. They're quite a tack on claims that attorneys, you know, will roll into something, but they're not where the where the you know the action is. They're not really the meat of the claim. The meat of the claim is always going to be negligence, and that's the and, and basically. To, to assert a negligence claim, somebody's got to prove that you as the applicator um, violated or failed to adhere to the standard of care owed to neighboring property owners uh, when you're engaged in a pesticide or a herbicide application. Now, where do you get the standard of care? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to phrase this question too for your understanding. Um, so legal liability, comes about when you, when you do not adhere to the prescribed standard of care. Who sets the standard of care? Well, that's a good question. In the end, a jury sets the standard of care. But uh, when you're making a claim against an insurance company, attorney is presenting it as, you know, this was negligence because they failed to do this and failed to do that and failed to do this. And, um, and that's, they're arguing that this was not adhering to the standard of care. So the question you always have to ask yourself is, what should a reasonably prudent uh, herbicide applicator have done to protect against non-target injury? And if you did all those things, then you're in the best position you can be to be uh, essentially found to not have been negligent. Number one, comply with all laws and regulations. Obviously, if you're violating the law, or if you haven't done what is required by a, a regulation, you're not in very good stead to say that you were exercising the proper standard of care to protect neighbors against injury. So, uh, in fact, if you violated a regulation, that's called negligence per se, which is, again, my example, that's like running the stop sign. You did you, The rules of the road are there. That's not only a ticket for running a stop sign, but if you caused an accident, you are negligent per se. You, uh, so that's, that's a very open and shut case against you if you're not following the laws and regulations applicable to whatever activity you're engaging in. Um, number two, comply with all the best practices that are perhaps not mandatory by law, but they exhibit that you're exercising the highest standard of care that you can. So that's the key to a negligence claim. You need to comply with all laws and regulations, and you need to comply with whatever the best practices are for the activity that you're engaged in. That's the best way you position yourself to avoid negligence claims for non-target injuries in the application of herbicides. Okay, now, having said that, I'm just, I have a slide in here and you'll be able to give access to these slides. There is no set uh, law in Pennsylvania at this time that the application of an herbicide is in fact one of these ultra hazardous activities like blasting, where you could be found liable regardless of whether you may have been negligent or failed to use a reasonable standard uh, of care in regard to protecting the neighbors. Uh, there is a case that deals with uh, using insecticides within a home. And I just have this here because it's a little sort of 
uh, exception or caveat that I need as an attorney. I got to include it. But the bottom line is, you're really still, this is where the meat is. This is what you should be worried about is the negligence claims and trying to make sure that you're doing everything that you can do to show that you have exercised a proper standard of care uh, and proper measures to protect neighboring property owners from injury. Okay, having filled your head full of a bunch of legal jargon, I'm gonna stop now, turn it back to uh, Scott and Tom Ford, and they will take it from here. I'll see you later. Thank you, Brooke. Tom, you're up. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am, Scott. Go ahead, and uh, you have slides to share, I take it. You bet. Okay, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is about the drift aspect as well as uh, root uptake as conduits of plant injury. They're both two key factors in causing injury. Uh, drift typically is more commonly observed, but we do see situations where root uptake is the uh, principal cause of plant injury. So let's start, start off with physical drift. When we talk about physical drift, it's actually the movement of the pesticide through the air, either at the uh, time of the application, um, typically to a non-target site. So usually, it is a droplet, a particle that's moving um, right there at the application time uh, across the field, perhaps to damage the non-target. And when you look at the aspects or the factors that influence physical drift, they'll include things like wind speed, boom height, uh, if your boom is too high in the air, um, your operating pressure, too high a pressure, gives you too small of a droplet size. And then of course, ultimately the droplet size of the of the, the spray particle that you're, you're utilizing. All those factors contribute to the issue of physical drift. Here's an example of physical drift. This is a pigment inhibitor product. This is mesotrione. We find it in a product called Lumax, Callisto, uh, Tenacity in turf care, and maybe in other combination products as well. Uh, but in this situation, the pigment inhibitor was applied in a cornfield. Uh, more than likely, the operating pressure in the spray boom was too high. The particle size was too small. It could have been that the wind speed was also higher than what was desired. But either way, the herbicide drifted across a two-lane highway, hit this honey locust tree, but also hit a large commercial cherry orchard and caused the sort of the whitening of the foliage, the bleaching of foliage. So this is a good indication of physical drift with a pigment inhibitor type herbicide. Then we will think about physical drift droplet size. Uh, uh, Brooke was talking about the, um, some of the aspects of drift and negligence. Well, if you have the wrong droplet size, um, then in some cases you could be negligent. So we look at droplets are measured in microns. And we look at the photo on the right side, we see a single human hair, that's 50 microns uh, as far as the size. The bottom of the image is a plain old ordinary standard staple. Well, when we look at pesticide spray droplets coming from your boom sprayer um, or from a piece of equipment, they're in the 20 to 370 micron range uh, size. So the, the potential is, is that they could be much smaller even than what the human hair is. So when we think about the average droplet size, it's about 200 microns. And then typically anything less than 100 microns is typically um, has a greater drift potential. So when you think about droplet size, if you have a droplet the size of a human hair, you're definitely gonna drift, have a greater drift potential. Um, even when we start looking at the staple, that staple is probably closer to 200 or 300 microns. So again, think about the relative size of your droplets, but small droplets get carried by the air further and unfortunately can do more damage. Um, I've used this slide before, it talks about droplet diameter in microns and the time to fall 10 feet. And we look at a 20 micron size droplet, it can take four minutes to fall 10 feet. And so we think of four minutes, how long, will it take to traverse your field 
and damage the adjoining or adjacent property. If we actually look at uh, suspending uh, a boom or having a sprayer 10 feet off the ground with a three mile per hour wind, and again, we go with uh, various uh, drop diameter sizes from 400 to 100 microns, and we'll go down and right down to 100 microns, a fine particle size, we're looking at it can drift 48 feet from a 10 foot drop. So again, think about property boundaries, property borders, and in many cases, we have a lot of applicators applying product at 50 microns or even smaller in some cases. So the potential for drift, at least particle drift, can be significant. Now, talk a little bit about uh, when we start talking about negligence and negligence theory, one of the things that's a key issue is, is what strategies did you deploy to mitigate risk? And we'll talk, talk, we'll touch on this a little bit later on, but one of the things we look at is what we call invert emulsion. And I just have a simple eyedropper here dripping a, a droplet of water. But when you look at invert emulsion, it's actually the oil encapsulation of a spray droplet. So what happens is that oil encapsulation helps the droplet retain its shape, uh, does eliminate evaporation, and then also functions as a drift control agent. So one strategy to mitigate risk may be to use the invert emulsion technique with certain products. Not all products can be used or deployed this way, but invert emulsions are one way to mitigate, uh, mitigate uh, particle drift in, on a property. So one of the things that we always talk about are best management practices. And we think about very, if you're a very old school applicator, uh, we may hang a piece of ribbon on a stake or a tree, um, try to note what direction the wind's coming from um, and say, yeah, this is what I'm using to, to look at uh, where the wind's coming from, what wind speed we're dealing with. But you know, that's probably not gonna be the best uh, course of action in a court of law. When we also look at, um, a ribbon blowing in the wind, um, you may know that the direction is coming from the Northwest, but you may need to have actually um, maybe a little bit better data, really exactly what direction is coming from. So some applicators have uh, reached their back pocket and out of their old uh, camping gear perhaps, and they pulled out some of the old uh, compasses to actually do a better job of recording exactly where the wind is coming from, from a directional standpoint. A better solution may be uh, integrating a smartphone with a portable anemometer. What's nice about this is not only does it uh, calculate the wind speed, but it also records the direction the wind is coming from. It can record the temperature. It can record also the relative humidity. And then all that data can then be imported back into your pesticide record keeping form. If you notice with uh, Pennsylvania record keeping forms, we don't usually have a column for uh, wind speed or wind speed direction or relative humidity. But in my opinion, they are things that I would add to the Pennsylvania spray records, again, to mitigate your risk as an applicator. Now let's talk a little bit about vapor drift. This is a uh, bed of delphiniums. An acre of cut flowers is worth between twenty dollars to $25,000, okay? The, in this case, it was a farm application of a phenoxy herbicide, an auxin-based herbicide. The auxin-based herbicide volatized, drifted from a corn field in this case into the cut flower field, resulting in significant plant damage. Well, $20,000, $25,000 may not seem a lot for one acre of flowers, but we have growers in Pennsylvania with 35, 50, 75 acres of flowers. So it could be very significant in an area where those auxin type herbicides are used very frequently. So we talk about vapor drift as kind of the volatilization. So a chemical is applied, and then what happens is, is it evaporates, okay, it turns into a gas. And that gas, unfortunately, can drift um, across large distances. Under the best case scenario, it evaporates and goes straight up into the atmosphere and causes no damage. But some of the factors that we look at with vapor drift is that every product has um, sort of, a, uh, I guess you could say, a categorization of volatility. There may be a categorization of its vapor pressure, so how susceptible it is to uh, volatizing. 
We know that vapor drift increases when we have higher temperatures, and we know that vapor drift, unfortunately, um, uh, the impact can be uh, increased with wind speed and, and winds. So when we think about vapor drift, we also have to look at thermal inversions. This is a pumpkin field injured by dicamba. Uh, dicamba, unfortunately, is used in tank mixes with glyphosate. And even though some of the formulations of dicamba have been a low volatility form, when the dicamba is combined with glyphosate, the glyphosate product lowers the pH um, in the spray tank, which then increases the volatility of that low volatile dicamba formulation. So um, we see in the, the photographs of the grapes, well, unfortunately, we also see vegetable crops injured by vapor drift from a low volatile form of dicamba, but the precursor here is, is its combination with the glyphosate. What makes vapor drift worse is what we call a thermal inversion or a temperature inversion. Now, when we think about a thermal or temperature inversion, and those terms are used interchangeably, is that the air closer to the earth is considered to be cooler and denser. When you have a temperature inversion, the earth, um, the air moves typically horizontally over the earth's surface, which means that a product that goes into a gaseous state, an herbicide, can basically drift a long distance in its gaseous state because it's sealed off from escaping to the atmosphere because of this temperature inversion. When you look at a temperature inversion, the winds can actually vary dramatically, the wind speed, the wind direction. Uh, they can swirl. Uh, if the winds were normally coming out of the, the Northwest, in that inversion, uh, with that inversion in place, they may actually be moving from the Southeast. So things can occur uh, really vastly differently than normal when a temperature inversion occurs. One of the keys to um, understanding that if an inversion is present, is sound. Um, we have a tr an old train that runs through um, a valley near me. And most days you never hear the train whistle. When an inversion is in place, the train sounds like it's in your backyard. The whistle is that loud and that intense. That's a key that an inversion is present. So sound travels long distances when inversions are there. So that's something to kind of key yourself into as a, at least an audible cue that an inversion occurs. Now this is looking down in the valley from my home and you see the lower level cloud there, uh, maybe fog or haze. And that tells you for the most part that an inversion is present, that we have warm air above the cold dense air. So an herbicide applied to the field there in the lower part of the picture if it's an auxin-based herbicide and it volatizes, it's going to go up, meet that inversion layer, and basically just glide right along that cloud cover and maybe deposit a couple of miles away onto a susceptible crop or a susceptible commodity. So there are ways that you can avoid vapor drift. This is on a grapevine in the uh, Lancaster County corridor. Um, there is uh, forested areas on basically four sides of this, uh, of this vineyard. And so the herbicides would have had to have been applied in adjacent fields or in adjacent properties and then came across as vapor drift to injure that grapevine. Well, one of the things that is out there is what they call a thermal inversion meter. And we can spend a lot of time on thermal inversion meters, but these meters are an outgrowth of, lot of, of the, I guess you say, of the vapor drift issue in the Midwest. What a thermal inversion tester does or meter does is that it can measure the temperature, typically a boom height, and then measure the temperature um, up to maybe 10 feet in, in, in height above where the boom was, uh, was operating. And what it can do is it can predict if an inversion is present at the time of application or prior to an application. So a smart applicator to mitigate risk would use a thermal inversion meter to make determination if it's safe to spray that product 
before they actually do so. So in the Midwest, if I was a soybean grower or I was applying an herbicide in a ROW situation where I knew that the product had the capacity to volatize and go off as a gas, one way to mitigate risk would be to deploy the thermal inversion meter to see if an inversion was present. If an inversion was present, what I need to do is to back away from that application until the inversion had dissipated. That's a great way to mitigate risk. The last one I wanna talk about is root uptake. And in this case is the herbicides are typically soluble herbicides. They're taken up by the roots in the, into the plant and there are various factors that influence root uptake. Some cases, the chemical properties of the herbicide product, as well as the susceptibility of the plant species to the compound. Some cases, the location or placement of the chemistry around the susceptible plant or crop. Uh, some cases, the extent of the root system into the, treated, into the treated area, as well as the rainfall. When we look at uh, a desirable tree or shrub, uh, the root system often extends two times the height of the tree, two times the height of the shrub. So in many, many situations, if you're applying a chemistry to the soil, if the roots extend into the area that has been treated, there is a great propensity for root uptake and plant injury. When we think about this golf course here, and we see some large mature trees on both sides of that course, we realize that chemistry is going to be applied to the turf areas. If there are products there like dicamba that have the capacity to cause root injury or root uptake, those trees, root systems, unfortunately, are going to extend from the rough areas into the fairways. And when chemistries are applied in those fairways, those trees, unfortunately, could definitely pick up some of those chemistries resulting in plant injury. When you think about ROW, um, applications in particular, you're often using tank mixes with multiple products, some with soil activity, and what's going to potentially happen is, is that those roots extending into that treatment area may pick up those chemistries and unfortunately get injured. When we look at dicamba specifically, this is a U in a home landscape in the Cambria County area from last year. A company was applying dicamba applied the dicamba too close to the root zone and not only damaged the U here, but damaged a peach orchard, uh, some apple trees, um, and most definitely a, a grapevine uh, that was growing in the property, all from root uptake. One of the most uh, recent nationwide cases which involved root uptake was with a compound called aminocyclopyrochlor. Aminocyclopyrochlor is off the market for turf applications, but is still listed for right-of-way applications in certain situations. Well, aminocyclopyrochlor was in a product called Imprelis that was uh, distributed by DuPont in about 2011. And it caused estimated, I believe, a half a billion dollars worth of damage. And in this situation, the damage occurred due to root uptake. And so compound, the compound was applied uh, close to desirable uh, trees and shrubs and the plant material absorbed the chemistry, took it up through its root system and translocated typically to the merosomatic tissues and caused dramatic uh, uh, injury symptoms and in some cases, significant tree mortality. So root uptake again, another conduit of plant injury. And then I'll stop right there. Well, thank you, fellows. My gosh, that is a lot of material. And so we've got some things to, to talk about. We, um, you know, we don't have any questions on this yet. Uh, but uh, I'm thinking, uh, just trying to run back through it all. Uh, thinking of the, to say to our, our applicators today, one of the, the first things they would think about or now what was that uh, about trespass and about negligence? What were the definitions that we talked about as far as those two? Look, I think I got you muted. On there we now. go, there we go, okay. 
Yeah, you want me to address that again? Here, I mean, let me. Yeah, let's share. go over that again. We got a little bit of time, so. Okay. Now, don't forget, Scott, that I I do have some more slides to talk about for our section that we were talking about is risk mitigation. Oops, um, I forgot. Uh, we want yeah. to go through that. You bet. Okay. Yeah. All right, Tom. If you're okay, I'll I'll go ahead and just cover the things I was going to talk about, and but try to be quick. Uh, I have I only have a few slides. Uh, and then we can sort of team up or do pick, you can pick up from there. Let me get into sharing mode here. Okay, now. All right, I think we should be, there we go. Okay, now let me go ahead to where I was, okay. The, the topic we were going to talk about was sort of, okay, now let's assume that you have heard wind of some type of claim. Um, first thing I, you know, and we want to talk about how to handle that and what to do in response to it. And, and Tom, I will leave for you uh, sort of the, 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 uh, the PR, the, the, you know, the complainant relations part of it, dealing with that person. I, I want to give you some insurance info so that people understand the role of insurance in all of this. Basically, just there's two scenarios with regard to, and the insurance term for these types of claims, it's the term of art in the insurance world is chemical drift, because it can apply to more than just herbicides or pesticides. Um, so uh, you can have a chemical drift where you as the landowner are the applier. In other words, um, you are applying to your own property and then you have a non-target injury off the property, or you could be as a commercial applicator. I did, I sort of note that, although I'm assuming that most of everybody on here is a, is a, you know, uh, going to be applying on other people's land. In other words, not on their own land. However, just to be, be aware, um, you know, if you're applying from your own land and then, you know, uh, it, there's a non-target injury on a neighboring property, the insurance policy that's going to kick in is going to be, you know, your basic farm policy, which has your, not only does it have your fire and your other, you know, uh, casualty type losses, but it's also going to have your, or casualty type coverages, it's also going to have your liability coverage um, for injuries, accidents, et cetera, to third parties. Um, and uh, now, a farm policy generally has some form of pollution exclusion, or we'll put it this way, it generally would might or, or it's, it's important to be careful and make sure that it does not exclude, let's just say it that way, um, any type of an exposure like the chemical, like chemical drift. And so pollution exclusions are a term of art in the insurance world, and they can really mess with you if you are in this area where you're a landowner who's applying on your own property. So you need to discuss with your agent if that's something that you're going to be doing, like you're a vineyard owner and you're applying to your own uh, property or whatever, you know, you're, you're doing your own work and doing your own applications, then you need to be very knowledgeable as to what's in your policy and you need to buy a chemical drift liability endorsement um, because you uh, may in fact not have the proper coverage. Now, if you're a commercial applicator, you're going to have your standard commercial, you know, uh, general liability policy. You know, this is your business. So just make sure your agent knows that, you know, exactly what your business is uh, and that they're not, you know, whoops, sorry, that they're not, uh, you know, somehow absentmindedly uh, not offering you the proper chemical drift liability endorsements to get around the pollution exclusion. All right, so hopefully that's, uh, uh, that's clear. Um, now, note that there are differences sometimes in insurance coverage uh, per, with regard to chemical drift liability, depending on whether it's from an aerial application or not. So uh, you have to also be attentive to making sure that if in fact you're in any way going to be involved in aerial applications, that you have the right coverage for that. Because sometimes even in a chemical drift uh, liability endorsement, you might still have an exclusion for aerial application. So then you got to buy a separate endorsement uh, for that, that covers aerial applications. So just be aware that exists. Now, Every single claim should report it to your insurance carrier as soon as absolutely possible. Do not play games with this. Do not think that you're going to talk these people down, that you're going to deal with this yourself. 
because your insurance company, you know, with the, with the nature of, of, of the claim and the fact that you're dealing with, you know, living plants, they're going to have a progression of potential decay or non-decay, uh, and you're having chemicals that may or may not still be detectable on site, you need to get their investigative people involved immediately, or they could turn around at some point and say to you that your coverage may be in jeopardy because you didn't promptly report the claim and give them a chance to preserve and observe and document the evidence as quickly as possible. So do not delay, no matter what you think, you know, you can make this person, you know, see something and you think you can convince them that this wasn't you or whatever it is, do not mess around with reporting it to your insurance company. This is a particularly, you know, uh, important instruction in this particular type. Now, I have here a link, and if you get my PowerPoint slides, you'll, the, you'll be able to just click on it. This is an, a wonderful article about liability coverage for chemical drift, in, in, uh, uh, and it's brand new. It's just from June of this year, and it's in the grapevine of all places, because it's basically tailored towards vineyard owners that do their own applications. But this is an excellent, excellent read through that will really make you feel like you understand the insurance insurance situation. Uh, other possible exclusions. Most um, <clears throat> policies are going to have an exclusion. I keep accidentally uh, advancing or going back. Damage to your own property, crops, or animals. So again, if you're applying on your own property, it's not going to cover damage to your own. Uh, so just be, be you know, aware of that. Um, that's not covered. It's his liability coverage. It covers other people's uh, potential property damage. Um, it doesn't cover damage you expected or intended to occur. I, I don't see that really being too applicable here. It doesn't cover bodily injury. So they, these coverages do not cover people that claim if you have if somebody's on the you know hypersensitivity you know registry or some other you know actual personal injury exposure that's we're not here to talk about those things today i should have noted that before we're just talking about property damage and most of the coverages don't cover that anyway um and also if you have some type of uh, government mandated testing or cleanup of pollutants pollutants that you're doing then the, this coverage doesn't apply to a, a, an exposure or a non-target injury that can occur during these types of activities. It's only for a routine course of business. A um, couple other things just I wanted to mention. Uh, to avoid negligence claims, the key thing is this whole, this whole concept of the standard of care is know and follow all the EPA and PDA guidance. And if you don't do the basics, your insurance company just can't help you. So um, if you are, you, you need to follow all rules and regulations, it's just like driving down the street. If you aren't gonna stop at the stop signs, don't expect your insurance company uh, to be uh, carrying you much longer uh, when you cause accidents. It's the same exact thing. You need to know your business and, do, and don't get caught doing something that is an, um, an outright you know, open and shut violation of the law or regs. Um, and even the guidance, because the guidance is going to be used as an example of what you should have done. Also, there are a lot of resources around for those who uh, suspect that they had damage. Know what they have out there in their quiver, so to speak, and prepare accordingly. This is just an example of, I used not a Pennsylvania version, this is from uh, Extension in Purdue, uh, from Purdue in Indiana, but there's all kinds of nice pamphlets and color spreads and internet materials all about do you think you had a, you know, a, an overspray uh, uh, damage on your property? Well, do this, do this, do this. So they have a lot of materials telling them what to do if they suspect that there's been an overspray. So uh, be aware of that stuff. Reading that stuff can help educate you about what you ought to be thinking about. Um, so because most of the materials are from this perspective, not from your perspective. You know, this seminar is one of the few things I've found that is from, you know, the applicator's perspective. Uh, so, Tom, that's, that's some of the things I wanted to mention. So I'll just turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. Take it away, Tom. Okay, 
quickly just talk a little bit about some risk manage, risk mitigation again as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some best management practices. When you're applying any product, we want to make sure you pre-plan your application. Make sure you evaluate the site, uh, look at the adjacent area, kind of note if there are any wells, lakes, ponds, streams, ditches, waterways. Um, I've seen chemistries unfortunately applied in areas where a label has prohibited their use because of, uh, we'll say, uh, geologic features there, uh, which may be a, um, a sinkhole or fractures in the geography, perhaps, or geology there. Uh, their gardens present, sensitive crops or ornamentals. Uh, crops not on the label um, in, in certain situations, that may be an issue. Um, some cases try to identify the neighbors that surround a property to make communication much easier. If you have a problem site, try to look at using a buffer zone or a setback. Always note wind speed and direction as far as in your records. I always, again, note temperature and humidity when I start an application. Um, I'd even include the nozzle selection um, as far as in your record keeping. Uh, if you can uh, look at the volatility of a product, you may make that selection based on volatility. Many products will have uh, information on the label, but you may actually have to go to either the safety data sheet or perhaps even uh, have a discussion with the manufacturer to see how volatile the compound is. Um, evaluate the product uh, for its potential for damage and see if there are any alternatives that can be utilized in some cases, it may be even a different methodology as far as trying to apply the chemistry like an inverted emulsion. Uh, can you use a drift control agent that may assist you? Um, and again, inverted emulsion. So what I wanted to end with is just kind of give you a real life story since we're up on time. This is some years ago. Um, I got a call from a commercial applicator who had been retained by a farm and they had applied a chemistry to some cornfields. The applications were on the other side of a large hedgerow that um, we'll say was at least 30, 40, uh, 30 or 40 feet of, of trees, uh, brushy material, so it was not just a single row of trees. And the pe pesticide company, the company that applied the chemistry, indicated that a neighbor next door who was this, he, he described him as a cranky old gentleman, uh, was claiming that his orchard was damaged by their chemical application. And that cranky old gentleman um, was just trying to get them for some money. And um, they had gone out and looked at the site and they said there was no injury whatsoever in the orchard. And um, what had happened was that the cranky old gentleman was going to um, either file litigation or file a complaint with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And so the applicator decided to get a hold of me before PDA got involved in this case. And they asked me to walk the orchard and to give them my unvarnished opinion as far as what had occurred. And as you looked at the orchard, you see that the orchard was not maintained very well. There were hosts of disease problems and insect problems. But then you also noticed the petioles bending down in some of the fruit trees, almost like an epinastic growth, an elongation of the petioles. And as you can see, the elongation of the petioles there, and even this last one here, where it's very pronounced on the pear, that injury is caused by exposure to an auxin based herbicide. And as much as the applicator did not want to um, believe me, the reason why the orchard was damaged was due to auxin-based herbic herbicides volatizing and then drifting over as vapor drift into the orchard causing damage. There was no damage in the hedgerow, but damage in the orchard. And so with vapor drift in this case, the sad part about it is, is that if they had talked about it and had really dealt with the complaint seriously, all this little orchard owner wanted was a bushel of apples and two bags of squirrel corn. 
So for a bushel of apples and two bags of squirrel corn, the pesticide applicator and the farmer in question were going to head to court to fight this, this aggrieved property owner. Um, this is kind of almost a ridiculous case, but it's a situation all applicators need to know what the modes of actions of the products that they are using and how to recognize the symptoms of plant injury. In this case, the individual who walked the property for the pesticide applicator evidently did not, could not recognize the plant injury symptoms. So um, I think the, there's, there's two morals here. One is applicators need to be able to recognize uh, injury symptoms, but you have to talk to the agreed parties. Talk to them, respond to the complaints, respond immediately and in person, listen to the aggrieved party, don't argue with the aggrieved party. If they want a list of the products applied, provide them with the labels. If you agree to follow up with something, do it. Document the complaint for your records. And one of the big ones is, is don't make promises that you or your insurance company won't keep. I think that's a critical element here. And so um, I encourage applicators in many situations to contact Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture right away in that respect. So um, we'll end it there. That's excellent. Uh, fellas, did you have a last thought before we, we wrap up with our, with our groups? My last thought, Scott, is simply exactly what Tom said, which is I used to do insurance claims, mostly car accidents, uh, back, way, way, way back, decades ago. And uh, you would be astonished at how many times something gets out of hand. And the reason that it's gotten out of hand is because the party who is the aggrieved party remembers some little tiny tidbit of thing that, that was said to them that they were offended by at the scene of the accident. And they would say things like, I never even would have hired a lawyer had, had they not done X. And so that kind of thing, exactly what Tom is talking about is exactly right. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many times little things that happen that, you know, uh, stick in somebody's craw and it could have been all, you know, uh, avoided or at least much less emotionally uh, resolved, you know, had uh, cooler heads prevailed at the outset. And courtesy. Well, there's a message for us. And, you know, actually, that's a segue into what I wanted to do as we, we have your contacts here on the screen, I hope. Does that show up for everyone? And, yes, uh, yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it. it. Oh, good. Okay. Well, the next one, folks are going to be concerned about, I, that is not what I intended. I'm, now I've gone off the charts here. I wanted to share the screen link where we, uh, the fellows can get their credit. Scott, there's also a question, also a question. in the... Um question and answer section. I'm not familiar with the Arkansas. They put a link to it, but I don't want to get out of the webinar to, to look at the link, but. Definitely. Um, Brooke, do you want to uh, yeah. have a look at that one? I, I think that's what they're referring to is the actual homicide that occurred, because uh, I believe that was in Arkansas, not Missouri, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, obviously, obviously um, emotions, emotions have run have very, run very high, high in some in of these some damage, of these damage cases. cases. So I so think, I think Exactly what, exactly Tom, what said Tom said about, about treating, treating people with people courtesy, with courtesy and, respect, and respect, try to keep, try it, to keep it under control, under control and, and let calmer let heads, heads prevail, prevail from the very, from the very beginning. Beginning, beginning. Excellent advice in everyday language or in, and for every situation. Uh, while we have fellows still on board with us, I wanted to take a uh, a minute to talk about the survey. To gather credits for the survey, a fellow needs to go to it uh, and fill out this Qualtrics survey on extension.psu.edu slash IBM dash quiz. For those who are registered for this event, 
that means uh, you're looking at it right on your own phone, then you will have this sent to you uh, as in a little bit later as we get our recording ready and finished up. And uh, Brooke has a set of slides available for you in that package too. Tom, perhaps you want to make yours available. Uh, we hadn't talked about that, so you surely don't have to. But that quiz link will be available when you get the note. But you can go to the quiz ahead of time before you receive it. It's going to be a few hours before we get the recording back. So on that survey, there's going to be uh, 10 questions before we ask you for your license number. So one of the things we'll ask you is uh, one of the herbicide trade names mentioned in this presentation was dicamba. That's what we're looking for. And the next question is going to be one way to guard against volatilization problems is to apply an invert emulsion. The third is when receiving a complaint of possible herbicide application of off-target damage, you should listen carefully. This is what we just went over. Listen carefully to get all the pertinent information. Fourth one, a common symptom of plant exposure to a plant growth regulator or oxen type herbicide is puckering of the leaves as we've seen in these flowers and in this peach orchard or pear orchard we just saw and uh, on the grapes. Number five, according to an insurance industry study conducted in the 1990s, the number one reason for pesticide drift is applicator mistakes. Now we've got a few more questions here. Number six is what drift occurs when the pesticide that was applied volatilizes and drifts to a non-target plant causing plant injury. We're calling it vapor drift is what we're looking for there. Number seven, a thermal inversion is said to occur when a warm less dense air mass settles over a cool air mass that is lying near the surface. Warm air on top, cool air on the bottom. Number eight, tank mixing dicamba and glyphosate has been shown to increase volatility. volatility. Number nine, when applying herbicides, remember that the root system of a desirable tree can extend two times the height of the tree. That includes shrubs too, two times the height of the shrub. Could be farther in good soil, but we're looking for two. Number 10, which herbicide listed below does not have a growth regulator type of mode of action? And that is metsulfuron, which is escort. That does not have a growth um, applicator, uh, a growth regulator mode of action. So with that, you should be in good shape to negotiate your quiz and receive your credits. Now the quiz will, the survey will record your answers automatically. And uh, this is, it'll be show, it'll be said that to you again, that they're recorded, it knows you took it, and then it'll let you out of the quiz. So I wanna thank you for being with us today. And I really want to thank uh, actually all the folks who helped make this possible. Uh, it's uh, Brooke, uh, Tom, uh, Brian Wolniak, who was behind the scenes, our techie, and Julianne Schieffer, who is expert behind the scenes with me today. It, I, 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 I let out front today, but uh, other days we'll all be on board with this. So I want to thank you again and look forward to the quiz. You're welcome to go to it early and uh, have an excellent and safe operations out there, folks. Thanks again. Scott, Scott there's, there's one, one question. question. Oh, sorry. My good. Yeah, you bet. Somebody said Somebody they said didn't they hear, didn't your, hear last your last answer. answer. Oh, my last answer. Okay. Which herbicide listed does not have a growth regulator type of mode of action? And that was metsulfuron. Otherwise, we, the trade name is one that was listed as escort. That does not have a growth regulator mode of action. So hopefully this quiz will be common sense. And for fellows who are able to listen well, it should be a piece of cake. And uh, the, any any closures, folks? Anything? Any last thoughts while we're we're here and got them? Well, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I was going to say, Scott. I I, 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 looked I looked up the, up the um, 
last question question regarding regarding the the, uh, Arkansas Arkansas issue. issue. Ah, And it was basically basically because because an individual individual, um, was supporting the efforts efforts for for restrictions restrictions on on chemistry. chemistry. And And my my only comment comment is is that that Dicambo has has been been used for over 50 50 years safely. And since I can't have been used for 50 years, 50 years safely, I think it's only the, the new uses of it where it's being tank mixed with the herbicide resistant crops that has sparked the injury issues. Because if you go back, again, I've been around 37, 38 years now, and we have never had the level of dicamba complaints until we started going to the herbicide resistant crops. So. Um, I think you also have to look at that safe record of dicamba prior to the herbicide resistance issue um, and the herbicide that resistance or the herbicide uh, um, ready crops for the most part. I think that's probably a key component and those tank mix issues. Um, but I think that dicamba still can be used safely. Um, but again, when you look at regulations and strict regulations and such that this individual in Arkansas supported, it's unfortunate that their their properties were damaged, but we are seeing, unfortunately, um, these herbicide issues with volatility um, hit edible crops, organic crops, vegetable crops, and unfortunately, some tightening of regulations probably are needed to safeguard those other property owners. A lot of good lessons in today's show. I really appreciate it, fellows. And uh, again, uh, one thing I wanted to let you know again, uh, if you would like to have a certificate of attendance uh, for self-reporting, for landscape architects, other industries, uh, you're surely welcome to write me and make that request. Uh, registered foresters, uh, let me know and get a certificate ready for you. Everybody needs to, uh, it, otherwise, I mean, the folks who want me to do the reporting, uh, come through the survey for us. We're doing, and uh, another part of that is to say, how do we do for you? We appreciate your comments on that one too. But with that, fellows, uh, we we'll look forward to uh, sending you all the recording, those of you who have registered. And uh, Tom, Brooke, Julianne, Brian, thank you. And Dave Jackson, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.